one thing you didn't know about the Webb Telescope, and an invitation to Louvoir. The search for life must come first. I've been involved in astronomy for more than 30 years, and since the beginning of my career, I have always wondered why in life I embraced this profession at the expense of other youthful passions. This question has always remained unanswered. As much as I tried to explain the choice with a certain propensity for mathematics, I felt that the problem remained at a deeper and more elusive level. Until one night outside the astrophysical station in Bosque Alegre, Argentina, smoking a cigarette under an oppressively beautiful southern sky, I wondered if all I am seeing now was just a collection of gas and inanimate matter, if there was no hope of finding a single paramecium in the entire universe, would I still have the enthusiasm to continue? Would I feel the same things I feel right now? If we really were alone in the entire universe, if after centuries of searches, explorations of long and disappointing listening, only the echo coming back from the walls of an empty room would sadly reach us from the probes, would we still be here? At our instruments, I mean sacrificially pursuing distant and unconscious objects. Well, that night I finally understood that for me astronomy, space exploration, and everything I had followed with passion until then were just a means to get to the only thing that can give meaning to existence, the search for extraterrestrial life. Some of my colleagues think that my attitude is rather childish, but it leaves me completely indifferent. What is important to me at this moment is to explain why I am telling you these things. It's not a desire to be a protagonist, but only the desire to communicate my point of view on the Webb Telescope. That despite what you read around is, not in my opinion, the right instrument for the study of extrasolar planets, and also on the Louvoir Telescope, an opportunity that should not be wasted. Want to know more? Keep watching. As I told you, I am so convinced that the current purpose of astronomy should be the search for life, even before astrophysical research, that I feel compelled to go against the grain on what we can expect from the Webb Telescope. I am obviously happy for the success of the launch and for the good progress of all subsequent operations, but I am also not very optimistic about its ability to give us answers about the habitability of extrasolar planets. Okay, no doubt assuming that its complex, month-long deployment in space works as planned, Webb will become the most powerful and far-seeing observatory in the sky. It will have unprecedented capabilities to probe the earliest days of the universe, shedding new light on the formation of the first stars and galaxies, and it will observe in new detail the most distant regions of our solar system. Deep space astrophysics is what Webb was designed for in the early 90s, and this will be its real specialty. To investigate the matter, to go back to the origin of the universe, to explain black holes and dark matter. But we should not hide the fact that in those years, exoplanets had not been discovered yet, and therefore the instrumentation on board for that kind of research was only adapted afterwards. Then there is the question of priorities. Not only 90% of Webb's observing time will be devoted to solving problems of strict astrophysical observance, but there will also be a distinction for the remaining 10% dedicated to extrasolar planets. On balance, reviewing the proposals already filed by hundreds of astronomers, more than 9% of these concern the physics of exoplanets, not their biochemistry. Many of the first observations of the telescope, to say, will concern the so-called hot Jupiters, gas giants in which the presence of life can be excluded. Only 1% telescope time will be available to those who want to try to capture the presence of biological signatures in Earth-like planets. And I still do not know if this ostentatious lack of interest in the search for life first is due to the awareness of the astronomical community of Webb's reduced capabilities in this sense, or to the fear that the interest in this topic could be judged sentimental by other colleagues. One must then consider that the method that Webb will use to examine planetary atmospheres is that of transit spectroscopy. This implies waiting for the transit of a planet on the disk of its star in order to identify, backlit by the background light, the atmospheric corona that surrounds it. It is hoped that through spectroscopy we can then determine the composition by examining the spectral lines. However, this is not true for all planets. Apart from the obvious exclusion of those that never transit the disk, it must be said that for its design, Webb has limitations and can successfully study only certain types of objects. 
mostly exoplanets orbiting M-type stars or red dwarfs. No terrestrial planets around stars similar to our Sun, then. Red dwarfs are small mass, low luminosity stars and are by far the most common types of stars in the galaxy, but they are also stars subject to fierce bursts of radiation that could sterilize the surface of their eventual planets. I'm afraid the signals we'll get from rocky planets around red dwarfs will be very, very faint. They might be enough to tell us that an atmosphere is present, but the odds of them telling us anything about their biological signatures are very, very slim indeed. To make matters worse, Webb may have further difficulty detecting even the main sign of life that an exoplanet's atmosphere can offer us, oxygen, for two good reasons. The first is that Webb can only detect light emitted in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, while oxygen is most detectable in visible light emissions. The second is that a team of researchers recently discovered that even the atmosphere of a planet with an extremely small amount of oxygen could still be able to support life, and that precisely because of this characteristic, Webb would judge sterile. All this may be disappointing for many of you, but if you do not want to believe me, at least pay attention to the opinion of some of my colleagues. I am certainly not the only one to be so skeptical about the possibilities of Webb in the role of life seeker. Harold Connolly, who is currently involved with two asteroid sample return missions, Osiris Rex and Hayabusa 2 recently said, In my thinking, we will never be able to prove definitively through the data collected by Webb that a specific planetary body contains life. Habitable, most likely yes, or at least by our current definition of what life needs to survive. But life for certain? I don't think so. Ernst Demoyje and Chris Watson, both researchers from Queen's University Belfast in the UK, have instead declared, the search for potential biosignatures is fraught with challenges. Not only will any signals be small and difficult to detect, but there are also significant possibilities of finding false positives where signals are falsely attributed to biological origins, as well as false negatives, where genuine signals may be attributed to other causes. Laura Kreidberg, who is the Director of the Atmospheric Physics of Exoplanet Department at the Max Planck Institute, said Webb will not be able to definitively identify biosignatures. And when asked, will Webb be able to identify life on other planets? Sean Domigal Goldman, an astrobiologist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, said, I think the answer is, we shouldn't count on it. To summarize, Webb is a wonderful instrument that in the astrophysical field will certainly revolutionize our current vision of the universe, but unfortunately will not be able to meet the expectations of those who, like me and many of you, put the search for life before everything else. However, it seems our position is not at all eccentric and minority in astronomy. A few weeks ago, in fact, the National Academy of Sciences, in its decadal survey on astronomy and astrophysics, has expressed in this way, NASA should begin developing a space mission that can tell us whether life on nearby planets is abundant, rare, or essentially absent. The decadal survey is a document by the science community, an assessment of where we are scientifically in astronomy and astrophysics currently, and where we want to progress in the next decade. It's a stop at the map in the astronomy food court, charting a path to the next stop. The 2000 Decadal Survey recommended what would become the Webb Telescope. The 2010 survey recommended the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, scheduled to launch no later than May of 2027. The 2020 Decadal Survey, delayed by one year because of COVID-19, has directed its specific recommendations toward the construction of a space telescope capable of giving a definitive answer to the long-standing question of life in space. A telescope, at least in its general lines, has already been conceived and also has a name, LUVOIR, an acronym for Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Surveyor. The only problem is that the LUVOIR study team has produced signs for two variants, one with a 15.1 meter diameter telescope mirror, LUVOIR-A, and one with an 8-meter diameter mirror, Louvoir B. Both versions are intended to be serviceable and to operate at the Sun-Earth L2 Lagrangian point, about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, where Louvoir, like Webb, may maintain a stable orbit in the long term. Louvoir's strength and weakness has the enormity of its segmented mirror. This mirror would allow astronomers to discover and 
study hundreds of exoplanets while also performing revolutionary observations across a wide swath of general astrophysics. Assuming any true blue Earth-like worlds exist around the Sun's neighboring stars, Louvoir should offer the best odds of finding them. But putting such a demanding, deployable mirror into space translates to an astronomical cost. Estimates at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center have arrived at the realm of $20 billion for Louvoir A and $15 billion for Louvoir B. For the timing of realization, we speak of about 20 years from now, with the launch that could take place in the early 40s. Well, I'm also here to tell you this. For my part, I strongly and absolutely support the 15-meter version. And I would ask you to support my position. So talk about it with your friends. Write about it on your social networks. Do as you please. The important thing is that when the United States Congress has to decide which instrument to finance, its choice falls on the 15-meter version. It would be a huge mistake if in order to save a few billion dollars, the cost of a few stealth bombers, Congress would fall back on the smaller and cheaper version. Of course, the 8 meters of Louvoir B are already something more than the 6.5 meters of the Webb telescope, but the analysis of the increase in diameter of telescopes over time shows that when you pass from one technological generation to another, the increase must be at least double. With Louvoir A, we will really have the opportunity to remove from our minds the eternal question, the one that has always nagged us. Why waste this opportunity? Not to mention that under the emotional thrust of this grandiose undertaking, the instrument could be ready in less than half of the 20 years foreseen, taking advantage of the experience accumulated with the design and construction of Webb. If we want definitive answers to the biggest questions of all, it takes a big effort and a substantial investment, considering that the reward is learning that there's life on that planet orbiting another star right over there. It's clear that Louvoir A is the one telescope we must all join together to build.